Thus have I heard on one occasion, the Blessed One was living in Sawati in Jetta's Grove, Anathan Pendika's Park. There he addressed the monks thus, Monks, venerable sir, they replied. The Blessed One said this, Monks, before my awakening, while I was still only an unawakened bodhisattva, it occurred to me, Suppose that I divide my thoughts into two classes. Then I set on one side thoughts of sensual desire, thoughts of ill will, and thoughts of cruelty. I set on the other side thoughts of renunciation, thoughts of non-ill will, and thoughts of non-cruelty. What is non-cruelty? Answer, answer compassion. What's non-ill will? Loving kindness. As I abided thus diligent, ardent, and resolute, a thought of sensual desire arose in me. I understood thus. This thought of sensual desire has arisen in me. This leads to my own affliction, to others' affliction, and to the affliction of both. It obstructs wisdom, causes difficulty, and leads away from Nibbana. When I considered then when I considered this leads to my own affliction, it subsided in me. When I considered this leads to the affliction of others, it subsided in me. When I considered this leads to the affliction of both, it subsided in me. When I considered this obstructs wisdom, causes difficulty, and leads away from Nibbana, it subsided in me. Now this gives you the idea that he, he was thinking this. <coughs> it doesn't have anything to do with thought. It has to do with your mindfulness. When you see unwholesome states arise, you have a choice. That's where your decision, your free will is. You can either act like you always act when that kind of thing comes up, or you can start using the six R's and not react. That means act the way you always act when that kind of thought or feeling arises. Okay? So what we're talking about is using the six R's to keep your mind in balance. Now, the thing that is real important for you to remember is that the more you smile with your daily activities, the easier it is to be mindful. I, the easier it is to recognize when the thought first starts coming up, I don't like this. And you can let it go right then and relax. Whenever a thought of sensual desire arose in me, I abandoned it, removed it, did away with it, six art it. As I abided thus diligent, ardent, and resolute, a thought of ill will arose in me, or a thought of cruelty arose in me. I understood this thought of ill will or this cruelty has arisen in me. This leads to my own affliction, causes you problems. To others' affliction and to the affliction of both. It obstructs wisdom. How does it obstruct wisdom? What is wisdom? 
the links of dependent origination. How does it stop that? Remember what I said yesterday? Okay. Because of the craving, you're taking it personally. You think those are your thoughts and your feelings. And you can yell and scream all you want. But until you start to let go of the identification with those thoughts and feelings, you're just going to cause yourself problems and other people around you problems. So the key is six R's because you need to be able to relax that tightness and stop identifying with those thoughts and feelings. Stop taking them personally. The way it obstructs wisdom is you get so caught up in your in your thoughts and feelings, you're, you're not observant of anything. You don't know anything except the dissatisfaction in your mind at that time. You have no balance. You have no mindfulness. All you have is reaction. And of course, that leads away from Nibbana. When I considered thus, it subsided in me. Whenever thoughts of ill will or cruelty arose in me, I abandoned them, removed them, let them be, and relax. And did away with them. <clears throat> Whatever a monk thinks and thinks frequently and ponders upon that will become the inclination of his mind. Whatever you think, and you, this is where your opinions and concepts and ideas really cause a lot of problems. Because if things don't happen the way you think they should happen, then you get lost. You don't even know you have a body. All you have is this reaction to, I don't like this. I want it to be different than it is. And the more you give in to that, the more you think and ponder on that, the more intense and more off balance you become. So you have to be careful what you think about. And six R, when you're doing your daily activities, when you're doing your practice. There's no difference between sitting practice and daily activity practice. It's the same. So you have to consider that if you frequently think and ponder on something, then your mind's going to tend towards that. Now, if you think and ponder on something that's unwholesome, your mind is going to go towards the unwholesome. And it's going to keep thinking on, pondering on that more and more. But if you see that and six R it and bring up a wholesome smile, laugh, then the more often you do that, the more your mind tends towards that. So it's real important to understand that your habitual tendency can be changed. Your habitual tendency for anger to arise because I don't like this and it's no good it can be changed to, it doesn't really matter that much, or as the Thai say, my pen rai. Never mind. It's not that important. If he frequently thinks and ponders upon thoughts of sensual desire, 
he has abandoned the thought of renunciation to cultivate the thought of sensual desire and then his mind inclines to thoughts of sensual desire. If he frequently thinks and ponders on thoughts of ill will or cruelty, he has abandoned the, th the thought of non-ill will and non-cruelty to cultivate thoughts of ill will and cruelty. Then his mind inclines to, the, to those kinds of thoughts. What you think and ponder on, that's the inclination of your mind. It's real important to realize this because we have a lot of repeat thoughts. Every repeat thought you have has craving in it. I am that. And the more you give in to those repeat thoughts, the more you have a tendency to fall back into your old habits, your old ways of acting. Now the thing with Buddhism is if you really want to learn about Buddhism, you have to make up your mind that you're going to change. And the change is going to be a positive one, but you have to want to change. I had a man, I've been teaching him for many, many, many years. And he comes and he does a retreat. And he calms down a little bit. At the end of the retreat, he actually comes up to me and says, now I can be the way I was when before. And I keep asking him, why are you doing retreats? You don't want to change. So you're wasting your time. You have to want to change to let go of the unwholesome thoughts and feelings and develop new wholesome thoughts and feelings. But that's up to him. Just as in the last month of the rainy season in the autumn, when the crops thicken, a cowherd would guard his cows by constantly tapping and poking them on this side or that side with a stick to check and curb them. Why is that? Because he sees that he could be flogged, imprisoned, fined, or blamed if he let those stray cows into the crops. So too, I saw unwholesome states dangerous. Uh, I saw in unwholesome states danger, degra degradation, and defilement, and in wholesome states blessings of renunciation, the aspect of cleansing. As I abided thus, diligent, ardent, resolute, a thought of renunciation arose in me. I understood thus. The thought of renunciation has arisen in me. This does not lead to my own affliction or the affliction of others or to the affliction of both. It aids wisdom, does not cause difficulty and leads to Nibbana. If I think and ponder upon those thoughts even for a night, even for a day, even for a day and a night. I saw nothing to fear from it, but the excessive thinking and pondering might tire my body. When the body is tired, mind becomes strained. And when mind is strained, it is far from being collected. So again, this isn't about verbalizing and trying to develop his wholesome thoughts by repeating them over and over and over again. This is about learning how mind attention actually does move from one thing to another. 
and using the six R's. Opening, allowing, and staying on your object of meditation. When you do that often enough, you start to get a sense of balance where things used to bother you, they won't because you have the equanimity and balance of mind. And then you can let that be without reacting anymore. You start responding with using the six R's with keeping your mind in balance not giving in to the want to have anger come up because something doesn't happen the way I want it to it's not that important 95% of the time it's not important at all except when we take those thoughts and feelings personally and make them ours that's when we run into problems. So I steadied my mind internally, quieted, relaxed, brought it to stillness and collected it. Why is that? So my mind should not be strained. A big thing that happens is the feeling arises and it's an unpleasant feeling and you don't like it. And that causes that tension and immediately after that all of your thoughts, opinions, ideas, the way you think things should be but they're not. Your concept and your story and then the emotional state starts to arise habitual tendency. Every time this kind of thing comes up, I have these kind of opinions and thoughts about it. Now the emotion explodes at you. Are you mindful at that time? Not even close. Do you even know you have a body? Because you're so caught up in your head. No. Do you cause yourself harm or harm to others by having this kind of emotional reaction? Absolutely. You cause yourself harm, you cause your body harm, you hurt other people's feelings around you. That's not worth it. Never mind, it's not that important. <clears throat> As I abided thus diligent, ardent, and resolute, a thought of non ill will arose in me, or a thought of non cruelty arose in me. I understood thus this thought of non ill will or non cruelty has arisen in me. This does not lead to my own affliction. It does not lead to others' affliction or to the affliction of anyone. It aids wisdom, does not cause difficulty, and leads to Nibbana. Now, there's two kinds of Nibbana. One is called the mundane Nibbana, and the other is called the super-mundane Nibbana. Every time you six R and let go of that tightness, your mind becomes clear, your mind becomes bright, you don't have thoughts interrupt interrupting, your mind is pure. That is mundane Nibbana. That is the third noble truth, the cessation of suffering. Okay? You're going to have many, many, many thousands of millions experience of Nibbana 
every time you use the six R's, you are experiencing the cessation of suffering. That is Nibbana. The super mundane Nibbana comes when you've done it enough with the mundane Nibbana. If I think and ponder upon this thought even for a night, even for a day, even for a day and night, I see nothing to fear from it. But with excessive thinking and pondering, I, I tire my body. And when the body is tired, the mind becomes strained. And you have a tendency to try too hard. You have a tendency to... to to hold on to your object of meditation too tightly. Remember that everything in the Buddha's practice is about doing this. Letting go of the tension and tightness. That's what the meditation's about. Not trying to push the meditation to be the way you want it. Not trying to do it too hard. What you want to do is, if you're starting to get restless, you have to take a look at that restlessness and then back off. Don't try so hard. You're putting in too much energy, too much effort. One of the things that is very helpful in this practice is something that you never hear other meditation teachers talk about. And that is having a sense of humor about yourself. Laugh with yourself for trying too hard. <laughs> there I go again. See, it's real important. Why? Because when you laugh, you go from, I'm trying and I want this result, to, oh, it's only trying. Let it go. So it changes your perspective from the personal to the impersonal when you laugh with yourself. Laugh at how crazy your mind is. It comes up with all kinds of bizarre things, and that's fine. The more you laugh with it, the lighter your mind becomes, the better your mindfulness becomes. The easier it is to change your old bad habits and develop new good habits. So it's a real important aspect of the meditation to keep it light. Now, I've had a lot of meditation teachers and they were all in to try harder. not trying hard enough. you got to do it more. I had one teacher that told me I was lazy because I was only taking four hours sleep a night. So I cut it down to two. Did that help my meditation at all? Not in the least. And I did that for three months. So you know, there's a lot of a lot of the teachers will tell you, well, this kind of practice is real good. Try it for a while and see what you think. You try between three and six months to see if it's helpful to you or not. You don't just do it one or two times and say, nope, that's no good, because you don't know. I had one teacher that he he suggested that I. Uh, just use three postures. Never lay down. And I did that for six months. Did it help my meditation? Not in the least. It's a kind of discipline, and it's nice to have that kind of discipline and know you can do it if you have to, but it's not as useful 
for me personally, but it took me six months to find out. So I could see all the different things that I was going through and see whether it was really worth letting go of that or not. So when you take a suggestion, try it not just on the surface. Go for it for a period of time. And I, I put in a lot of effort. One meditation teacher told me that uh, in a day, if you were only taking four hours sleep, there was just over 50,000 seconds. And that's how many times I should note something. Once a second. Note, 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 note. Uh, wrong effort. You need to back off. Do it in a relaxed but aware way. If you try, to, if you have the idea, let's say you have a good sitting, and it was real nice and pleasant, but it was time to get up and you do your walking meditation, and then you come back and sit and you think, well, I'll do that again. Now that one thought, that one desire to make your meditation good is the very thing that stops it. And you start to get a little restless. And you think, well, maybe I'll put in more energy. And I'll try harder. And then you become frustrated because the restlessness gets stronger. What are you thinking and pondering on? You're thinking and pondering on, I want this to be the way I want it to be when I want it. I, 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 I. So what do you do? You become frustrated. So you try harder. And that's exactly the opposite of what you need to do. You need to back off. Don't try so hard. Let things come to you as they will. Your job is just to observe Use the six R's. Go back to your object of meditation. Don't try hard. You can't compare what this sitting is going to be like because you don't know what's going to happen next. Roof can fall down. Who knows? Better not. So give up the idea that I want it to be like it was. Because it's never going to be that way. And you're just causing yourself more suffering. So back off. Back off. Don't try so hard. Now there are times when you have to put in some energy and some effort when you get sloth and torpor. But the energy and effort you need to use is the energy it takes to be able to observe how sloth and torpor arises. What happens first? What happens after that? What happens after that? <coughs> and I've had oh, hundreds of students that tell me, well, I get too relaxed if I relax at that my mind. I'm already sleepy. I'll just go to sleep. No, you're not doing it right. You're letting go of the tightness so you can be more aware of how the process works. Sloth and torpor is real easy to see how it arises. You're not on your ob you're not taking a strong enough interest in your object of meditation. And you kind of let your th thoughts kind of ho hum a little bit and then it gets a little bit stronger and then you start getting into a dreamy state and then your back starts slumping 
and before long you're bobbing. Well, how does that process work? How did it arise in the first place? What do you have to do so the sloth and torpor won't arise? Take more interest in sending loving and kind thoughts to your spiritual friend. That picks up your energy right there. Investigate. Tweak your energy. Now, people that have sloth and torpor and they're bobbing like this, and they see that all of a sudden they sit up real straight and they try real hard and before long they're back to bobbing. Why? Because they're not putting in a balanced kind of energy and they're not observing how the process works. It's a real interesting phenomena to be able to work with sloth and torpor. The more interest you take in it and how it arises, the faster you can 6R. So you don't have those little tiny dreamy thoughts. You 6R those, but you have to do it with the right amount of energy. If you put in too much energy, it's going to burn out real quick. So you have to adjust your energy levels so that you're not putting in too much at one time. Now you put in a little bit of energy, see what happens. If you still start drifting off, you okay, there wasn't quite enough energy in that one. Let's put in a little bit more next time. Okay? Monks, whatever a monk frequently thinks and ponders upon, that will be the inclination of his mind. If he frequently thinks and ponders upon thoughts of renunciation, he has abandoned the thought of sensual desire to cultivate the thought of renunciation. And then his mind inclines to thoughts of renunciation. If he frequently thinks and ponders upon thoughts of non-ill will or non-cruelty, he has abandoned the thought of ill will and cruelty to cultivate the thought of non-ill will and non-cruelty. And then his mind inclines to thoughts of loving kindness and compassion. Just as in the last month of the hot season, when all the crops have been brought inside to villages, a cow herd would guard his cows while staying at the root of a tree or out in the open, since he needs only to be mindful that the cows are there. You need to be mindful that loving kindness is there. You don't have to push it. You don't have to make it grow bigger. You don't have to force it to do anything. You just are mindful that it's there and allow it to grow while you stay on your object of meditation. Okay? Tireless energy arose in me and unremitting mindfulness was established. My body was tranquil and un untroubled, my mind collected and unified, quite secluded from sensual pleasures. How do you become secluded from sensual pleasures? You have to speak up, I can't hear you. When you close your eyes, the sensual pleasure of seeing is not there. When there is a sound, you notice it, you don't pay attention to it. You'll let it be there by itself. 
It's just like I was talking about last night. Sometimes you can have thoughts, but you're still on your object of meditation. Ignore it. Don't pay attention to it. Right? And you do that at all the sense doors. Secluded from unwholesome states. How are you secluded from unwholesome states? Hmm? By using the six R's. Not having any craving means there's nothing unwholesome in your mind. Right? Secluded from unwholesome states, I entered upon and abided in the first jhana, which is accompanied by thinking and examining thought with joy and happiness born of seclusion. There's a lot of talk about jhana, but there's very little true understanding of what jhana is because almost everybody that practices jhana is practicing a form of one-pointed concentration. In other words, their mind becomes so one-pointed on an object that it won't move. But you don't learn anything when you're like that. The kind of jhana that he is talking about is the development of your understanding about how mind actually does work. And when you see that a feeling arises and this tightness happens and the thoughts coming up and your habitual tendency and then all of the rest, you're seeing it over and over again. As you become familiar with it, you start to stay on your object of meditation longer and distraction becomes less intense. Now when you use the six R's on that, you six R and it gets the distraction becomes weaker because you're not feeding it anymore. You're not keeping your attention on it. And finally, the hindrance just fades away. When that happens, you feel a very strong sense of relief. You have a lot of joy. And this kind of joy is called uplifting joy, where your mind feels very light and so does your body. When that fades away, you will feel a very strong sense of tranquility and you'll feel very comfortable in your body. And this is called happiness. Your mind is unified. Your mind is very composed and at ease. That's what the first jhana is all about. You can still have some distracting things come up but you'll see them more quickly and you'll be able to 6R come back without any problem. With the stilling of thinking and examining thought I entered upon and abided in a second jhana which has self-confidence stillness of mind without thinking and examining thought with joy and happiness born of collectedness. When you get into the second jhana, if you try to make a verbal wish for your spiritual friend's happiness, you start to get tightness in your head. So you let go of that verbal wish. Now you just bring up that feeling of your wish 
and put that feeling in your heart and radiate that feeling to your spiritual friend. This particular sutta is called the beginning of noble silence. Because you haven't got the thinking and examining thought distracting you. And you start to have confidence that, yeah, this is right. You know that you're on the right path because you're seeing how it works. And it works fairly quickly, works fairly easily. Which is something that I've been told in, excuse me, There. I've been told in Thailand that it takes 10 or 15 years to be able to get into a jhana. 15 years. I've been told in Sri Lanka they're, they're a lot more spiritually advanced. It only takes 10 years. That's when you're practicing absorption concentration. You're not practicing one-pointed. Uh, you are practicing one-pointed concentration, not what we teach here. A lot of the myth about the length of time that it takes to get into jhana is because it is very difficult when you're practicing one point in concentration. It's not difficult when you practice this. Two days, three days, you're in a jhana. And I've actually had some monks call me a liar that that's, that's impossible to get into a jhana that fast. Okay. It's up to them. They can believe what they want. But I, I've got a few thousand students and I see how fast it happens. So. With the fading away of joy, I abided in equanimity, mindful and fully aware, still feeling happiness with the body. I entered upon and abided in the third jhana, on account of which noble ones announce he has a pleasant abiding who has equanimity and is mindful. When you get into the third jhana, you no longer have joy arise. It's, it's too coarse a feeling for your, for your mind. You have a very strong sense of balance in your mind. You hear a sound, it doesn't make your mind jump. You just hear it, it just kind of goes through you, no big deal. If you come up, if, if I come up and I touch you, you would feel that. And you feel very comfortable in your body and very comfortable in your mind. Now, one of the difference between one-pointed concentration or absorption concentration and this kind of collectedness is when you get to the third jhana, you don't feel your body at all. Your mind becomes so one-pointed and so intense on that one object that you don't have a body anymore. You don't feel it. I've been around monks that have been practicing this and you can beat on them with a stick, you can yell at them, you can move their limbs around so that they look funny and they won't know that you did that when they came out. But this is called an aware jhana. That extra step of relaxing is the very key of the meditation that the Buddha taught. Because that relaxed step, it doesn't allow you to become absorbed in one object. 
And when you use that relaxed step more, instead of going this way, you start going this way, so you become more aware of things around you. So that's a pretty major difference between the two kinds of uh, practice. And when you practice according to the Vasudhi Magga, they talk very much about having a nimitta. A nimitta, that's a Pali word that means sign. And the, the way it's described is that there is a, a, a white kind of silvery white disc that happens in your mind and you start focusing on that. At first you're doing your breath or whatever your meditation is, then you take the nimitta as your object of meditation. Now, does that mean that there is full awareness and mindfulness? It, it's not there. You don't feel your body. You're not aware of sounds and other things happening around you, so that's not full awareness. But when you're practicing this kind of meditation, there is full awareness. You'll hear a car drive by, you'll hear a motorcycle, whatever. It doesn't make your mind shake, but you know it was there. Now, as you start going deeper in your meditation, you will start to not be able to feel different parts of your body. Like your leg goes, just you don't feel it. Or your hands or shoulder, whatever. As you let go of tension and tightness in your mind, you let go of tension and tightness in your body. So now you don't feel the gross body anymore unless you put your attention on it. And you don't need to. You will feel subtle things. You, you feel uh, wind or ants walking on you, little things like that. But it takes contact to, be, to have feeling. Otherwise, you don't feel it. And this is where you start purifying your blood. And that's quite nice. Now, eventually what happens is the feeling of loving kindness, because you don't feel your body anymore, you won't feel the loving kindness coming out of your heart, it will come up and come into your head. You don't try to push it back down, you just let it come up and use loving-kindness from your head. Okay? With the abandoning of pleasure and pain, with the previous disappearance of joy and grief, I entered upon and abided in the fourth jhana, which has neither pain nor pleasure and purity of mindfulness due to equanimity. So when you get to the fourth jhana, you, you don't feel your body anymore. You're just radiating loving kindness. And this is when I will change your meditation. When you get to the fourth jhana, that's when you become an advanced meditator, which is pretty reasonable. Uh, the Buddha praises the fourth jhana up and down. And he, he liked it very much when anybody got into the fourth jhana. Not as much as when they attained Nibbana, but it, it, it's a pretty major step. So, <coughs> what you think and ponder on, that is the inclination of your mind. The more you think and ponder on the six R's, the more your mind will incline towards the six R's. You want to get to a state where something starts to come up, your mind, you see it, 
and your mind automatically six R's and lets it be and relax and you come back to your object of meditation. And it'll happen by itself. So, the more you think and ponder on the six R's, the better your progress will become. Okay? <clears throat> Suppose, monk, that in the wooded range there was a great low-lying marsh near a large herd of deer where they lived. Then a man desiring their ruin, harm, and bondage, and he closed off the safe wood and good path to be traveled joyfully, and he opened up a false path, and he put out a decoy, and he set up a dummy so that a large herd of deer might later come upon calamity, disaster, and loss. But another man came desiring their good welfare and protection, and he reopened the safe path and good path that led to their happiness. He closed off the false path, and he removed the decoy and destroyed <coughs> the dummy so that so that large herd of deer might later come to growth increase and fulfillment monks i have given this simile in order to convey a meaning this is the meaning the great low-lying marsh is a term for sensual desire or sensual pleasures a large herd of deer is a term for beings a man desiring their ruin, harm, and bondage is a term for Mara, the evil one. Basically like a devil. The false path is a term for the wrong eightfold path. The decoy is a term for delight and lust. The dummy is a term for ignorance. The man desiring their good welfare and protection is a term for the Tathagata accomplished and fully awakened. The safe and good path to be traveled joyfully is a term for the noble eightfold path. So, monks, the safe and good path to be traveled joyfully has been reopened by me. The wrong path has been closed off. The decoy removed, the dummy destroyed. What should be done for his disciples out of compassion by a teacher who seeks their welfare and has compassion for them that I have done for you, monks? There are these roots of trees, these empty huts. Meditate, monks, do not delay, or you will regret it later. That is our instruction to you. That's what the Blessed One said. The monks were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. So there are these air-conditioned buildings, <laughs> huts. Meditate, monks. Do not delay. <laughs> yeah. Ask how you discovered images. By observation. And then I talked to a doctor about it. And some people think they're real smart, and they say meninges is just a uh, 
just like a sack. It doesn't have any muscles in it. It doesn't contract. Mm. It does because of the, the blood pressure and that sort of thing. There doesn't have to be for there to be tightness. I mean, why do you get a headache? Oh, everyone knows it's tightness. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Why do you get why do you get a headache? Yeah. Okay. You have any questions? Okay. Speak up so I can hear you. Renunciation, uh, not getting caught in sensual desire. Renouncing it, just letting it be there without, without getting excited by it. Okay? Now that can be for sights or sounds or tastes or smells or touch or thoughts. It's renouncing the craving, letting go of that. That's what true renunciation really uh, stands for. Well, it's a time to laugh and relax a little bit, stop trying so hard. <laughs> <laughs> Just back off a little bit. Take take a, a small breath and then start again without pushing. Okay? Okay. Let's share some air at that. May suffering ones be suffering free, and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we've thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty powers, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. sadhu.